Hello everybody, it's Jay Robing. I'm going to be starting a new series with this video for uh, chess middle game planning, strategy, and attacks. Uh, it's going to include examples of uh, Grandmaster level uh, kingside attacks, queenside attacks, and taking advantage of uncastled kings like this game is going to show. Uh, this game was played, I believe, let's just let me double check here, in uh, 1984. Uh, playing the white pieces was Gila Sachs, a very strong Hungarian Grandmaster who unfortunately uh, passed away. And uh, the black pieces was played by John Nunn. And um, we're going to take a look at this example on how Mr. Sachs basically uh, capitalized on the fact that black's king is not castled. And he formulates a plan to exploit that. Um, just a side note, uh, Mr. Sachs, a very strong Hungarian Grandmaster, like I said, uh, he won a lot of different tournaments. Um, had some very notable games and um, even influenced the career of Judith Polgar, uh, the strongest uh, women's chess player of all time, I believe, um, if not very close. So uh, some very good things you can find in his uh, database of games. Uh, he even won the Canadian Chess Open, I believe, as well. And um, just let me just double check that. I believe it was the Canadian Chess Open. Uh, yeah, Canadian Open Chess Championship in 1978. Um, so he's had some very notable uh, games. But let's get started with this here. So um, it's black to move in this position. I'm starting with black because I want to I want to highlight exactly what's going on here. So black brings the queen down to uh, a5, and I've highlighted the uh, the black king. I don't really know why black decided not to castle in this position. Um, but he wanted to play uh, an active queen position, I guess, so he put his queen onto a5. Um, so we're starting to build up a little bit of pressure on this knight here on c3. Um, it's sort of semi-pinned, I guess you could say, although, you know, there's a lot of defenders here on the white queen. Um, so from this position, there's a very, very strong move from white. So go ahead and pause the, position, or pause the video, take a look at the position, and see if you can find a really strong move for white in this position. Try to look at white's assets on the board, uh, for example, the queen and the rook there on the D file, um, and just try to see if you can find a nice strong move for white in this position to take advantage of the fact that the uh, uh, black king is not yet castled. Well, Mr. Sachs found this move. Knight over to F5. Now, it's a strong move because it's doing a lot of different things. First of all, it's attacking the undefended pawn on g7. Uh, it's also attacking the bishop on e7. Uh, but more importantly, it's putting another attacker onto the pawn on d6. So now we have the knight, the queen, and the rook bearing down on d6. Now, it's white's move, so black has a move to respond to this. Um, and obviously black is not going to let the position collapse completely here. So what do you think black's move was in this position? Well, quite simply, black said, I don't want to have anything to do with this. And black took the knight with the bishop on f5. Now again, let's take a look at the position. Obviously white's going to recapture here with the pawn on e4. But just think about this for a minute. What is this capture going to do for white? Well, Let's take a look. White recaptures with the pawn on f5, and what do we have now? We have an exposed file, an open file, leading all the way to the enemy king on e8. This is going to be troublesome for black. There's no pawns on the e-file. Now, granted, white's pieces aren't on the e-file yet, really, in any kind of large capacity, uh, but it's definitely opened up. From here, black plays rook over to c8. Once again, electing not to castle in the position, instead bringing another attacker onto the knight on c3. So the pressure is building up here. You know, black's got some uh, possibilities here. He could sack the rook, take on on uh, c3 uh, at some point, and maybe uh, come down with the queen and take the pawn on a2. So there's there's some things going on here for black um, that makes the position, you know, a little vibrant for black. So let's take a look at what Mr. Sachs did here. Well, Mr. Sachs decided to bring the king over to b1, give a, a, an extra protector to the pawn on a2, um, and get his king off of that file with the rook bearing down on it. Black responds, queen over to c7, giving another defender to the pawn on d6, and getting a nice little battery bearing down here on the c file. However, there's no huge threats to uh, white in this position. Mr. Sachs responds by pushing his pawn up now to g4. Now this pawn is not defended. It's attacked by a couple knights. Um, so black has 
an opportunity to grab the pawn if it so desires to do so. And exactly that's what uh, Mr. Nunn played. He took the pawn here on g4. And this pawn was a little bit kind of like bait, I guess you could say. Because after this move, white brings the rook over to g1. It's attacking the knight. The knight's defended, so black isn't panic mode yet. Uh, but I don't think Mr. Nunn took a look at the resulting moves that would follow. He pushed his pawn up now to g6. So he's attacking the pawn on uh, f5. I'm not exactly sure the rationale of the uh, g6 pawn push in this position. Um, you know, he can still castle. Black still has the option to castle in this position. The bishop can't really access g7 easily, so it's going to take a couple moves to get over there. Um, but I guess Mr. Nunn thought that this would be a good move in the position. Um, if you guys can think of a good reason to uh, push that pawn up there, go ahead and post that. Um, I don't think I would push that in that position, but I am definitely not a grandmaster, so there could be something that I'm missing there. Um, but if we go back a move, uh, a move like uh, g5 could not be played, or sorry, e5 could not be played because it just hangs upon. Um, so, you know, in the position, black didn't feel any huge threats coming on with this rook. The knight was defended. He pushed the pawn up, and now watch what uh, Mr. Sachs does. He comes in and he takes that rook with the, uh, or takes his knight with the rook. Black recaptures. White plays knight up now to d5, forking the queen and the bishop. Obviously, the queen needs to be saved. Queen peels back to d8. And look at that. Just a nice little uh, slide move over here with the rook onto e1. And now, all of a sudden, we got some big problems in the back uh, black position. Uh, the bishop's pinned now onto e7. Uh, it's got two attackers. What's black going to do? Well, black tries to bring the knight back to e5. Only problem, we've, we've got that covered. White takes with the bishop launching attack on the rook onto h8. Once the pawn recaptures, white comes in, snags that pawn up with the rook, and once again we have that pin on the dark square bishop, we have the knight attacking the dark square bishop, and we have the queen defending the knight. This light square bishop here hasn't even contributed to this brutal attack yet, but it is brutal for sure. Black finally decides to castle, and in this position obviously white snags up that dark square bishop, hits the check, King goes over to h8. Now, what does uh, white play in this position? White simply brings the light square bishop up now to d3. Um, the knight's still protected from the rook. This kind of severs the connection of the black queen to the white queen. And the white queen's got some ideas here. Obviously, it's got open access along this dark square diagonal. It's, it, it can do a lot of different things. It's got this whole rank to play with here on the second rank. Black responds queen now to d6, attacking that rook. The rook currently doesn't have a defender. White just drops the rook back, gives the bishop uh, defense of that rook. Uh, the knight still can't be taken. Uh, black doesn't have a lot of great options in this position, so it brings its rook over now to d8 to uh, you know create this little cannon coming down here onto the bishop on d3. But there's no real threats in this position. So from here, white plays queen to c3, hits the check on the enemy king. Uh, the enemy king uh, needs to be protected, so black pushes the pawn up to uh, f6, the pawn supported by the rook at which point white captures the pawn now on g6. Black obviously can't recapture, it's just going to fork itself with the uh, the king and the rook. So black takes the pawn on, on h2 with the queen, and white captures the pawn on h7, and black actually resigns in this position. It's just such a crushing position to be in that there wasn't, there's really no hope for black. Uh, for example, if the black king captures, we have this nice discovered check here with the bishop, and the queen will drop. Uh, if we go back to this position, if black tries something like queen takes pawn, uh, we have a similar thing. The rook comes over to h4. If the queen captures, we just have the uh, fork here with the king and the queen. So uh, that's definitely not good for black. And if the king tries to just get out of dodge by moving to uh, g7, it does open up a longer line. But unfortunately, the line just leads to nowhere. Um, and basically, it just gives a world of hurt for black in the position. And uh, white's going to queen here soon and black is pretty much done for. So it's a really good example of how uh, Mr. Sachs took advantage of the fact that uh, the enemy king just was not castled. And um, unfortunately for black, that led to a lot of problems and it was a really good plan um, for Mr. Sachs to capitalize on this. And uh, you know, I really, if I had a favorite move in this, this whole game, 
Um, I probably really like this move. I think it just really opens things up. Um, you know, it's a strong knight move. It's attacking a lot of pieces, but even more importantly, it's going to open up the E file. And now we're going to have a couple files open up onto the enemy king location. And that was key. And black really didn't have much of a choice here. So when he captured and the pawn recaptured, you know, we just had that nice open uh, file open up. We've got that weak pawn on D6, all kinds of things in this position. And then, of course, uh, another move that I liked was uh, simply pushing the pawn up here to g4. And, um, you know, that was pretty good, too. Kind of like a nice little bait move there leading up to the rook sack on g4. Now, obviously, black could have prevented this a lot, uh, you know, a long time ago. Um, black had several opportunities to castle. Uh, didn't take it. So if there's another lesson there is, uh, you know, castle as soon as you can. The, you know, there's no real reason to delay your castle. Um, unless you have something really solid lined up that you know is a forceful line and um, you don't have to, to uh, castle your king and get him to safety. Uh, but in, in all other positions, get, get your king castled. Get him out of the uh, firing line um, so that uh, something like uh, uh, this doesn't happen to you. <laughs> Alright guys, hope you enjoy the video. I'm really going to like this series here. I want to work on my middle game planning and attacking lines um, a lot. I think that uh, you know in my personal game... Um, the, the most improvement that I have is uh, is in the in this area. Like I mean, my end game's pretty good, my opening's pretty solid, and you know my middle game's not horrible, but it needs work um, for me to break this plateau and get to the next level of chess. Uh, so I hope you liked the video. Take care, and we will see you next time.